I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Well, this week is the week of Gen Con 2019. Gen Con is the largest uh, gaming convention in America. It is huge. 60,000 plus people are coming. We will be there. Booth 2023. We hope to see you. If you're coming by, certainly stop by. We've done some Gen Con coverage last week. We'll do some more this week. We're doing a live show on Friday that even if you're not there, I am under the understanding that that Gen Con will be streaming that show on their live streaming thing, so you can watch that there. So that's all exciting and such, but you may not be going to Gen Con. Well, that's okay, because we got a full week of content coming your way, and this show is about board games and the people who play them, so let's get started. Okay, so each week I talk about some interesting things I found on the internet, and if you have something interesting, you can always send it to me at tom at dicetower.com. First of all, I found these, uh, someone sent these to me, some videos from a, a YouTube channel, Extra Credits. And this is a series on why do we play Magic or how to play Magic. It's sponsored by Wizards of the Coast, but they're really well done and it kind of focuses on this from maybe a video game perspective for people who haven't played Magic before. And I like that. It's really well done. Meeples Like Us did a lengthy review of Secret Hitler, this uh, social deduction game that's been out for a while. So they, they really went in depth on it. You can check that out. Someone put a picture up. I just thought I found this interesting. The dollar store in their area with board games. This picture fascinates me because you see your typical dollar store stuff. And then modern board games. We all wish this store was in our area. Um, way Too Many Games uh, reviewed Hellboy, the board game. So if you want to more, mo know more about this property board game, it's one I haven't seen yet, although one I'm going to be trying to get my hands on because I do want to see what this game is like. If you ever have played the game Scythe, Scythe a fantastic game, here's a thread I found that sh points out some of the Easter eggs in Scythe. If you look closely at the board, you might see Thor, for example, or Santa Claus, or stuff on the board, and this, uh, and you just check this link to see more pictures of what's on the board. Uh, da uh, DangerGames.co has put up a website where you can look at board game reviewers. That includes the Dice Tower. What it does is it lets you sort the different board game review channels by average views per video, by most views, by subscribers and stuff. Now, I know this is a bit self-serving, right? Because I think we're winning a couple of the categories. It's not a big deal at all. We're losing other categories by a mile. But it is interesting. If for no other reason, you might find some great YouTube channels by checking it out. Um, the, if you are going to Gen Con this week, there's going to be construction in that area, in downtown area. So check out the link there to find out where that construction is going to be, when it's going to be, and how it might affect you. Um, Ars Technica has reviewed Terminator, the board game. A lot of uh, IP reviews and things, but I like the movie Terminator, so it'll be interesting to see what that's like as a board game. Smartphone had a Kickstarter this week. This is kind of news in a sense, but it's also the latest Dice Tower Essential, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention this one here. I really like Smartphone. I posted a how to play Smartphone, so you can check that out. Board Game Geek has a new art series. If you like, what they do is they take um, board games and then they find artists who did not do the art for that board game, make another famous board game artist, and that one does like their interpretation, and then they, they put these up on their website and you can buy them. They're really, really cool, so I would check those out. Uh, the Secret Cabal did a Gen Con preview special, so they're one of the podcasts on the Dice Tower, so I definitely recommend listening to them and checking that out. There's a lot of Gen Con preview stuff, obviously, um, including where uh, we are doing some coverage, but you'll see more and more of that come up on the internet. Alrighty, well, that's what I found this week on the internet. Let's keep going. It's your turn. Ooh. Hi guys, I'm Randy. I'm Alan, welcome to We Game Together. Talking Rec Raiders. <laughs> New-ish, new pretty new game new from ish. Origins. We got it. I thought it was going to be more on the kids' side, but it's definitely on the family, family yeah. plus weight. It's got family some meat plus. on its bones. 
Family Plus. Cool people were saying that, I think. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Lots of different ways of scoring. You can collect aquariums. You can collect treasures and placing them in two different areas to give you points depending on where they go. Mm -hmm. Seashells give you like extra um, special abilities. You roll the dice physically in the tray. Depending on where they go, that's where they go in the dice pool. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll get nothing. Sometimes you'll get <laughs> um, ones that have shelves that come with it. You draft those. You put that diver in that numbered spot whether it's mm -hmm. on the sand to get seashells or in the diving area to get treasures yeah and really something neat. i really love about a game in general is when you're uh, like getting things on somebody else's turn i always right. love that um and so like in this game if he would kick my diver off of my spot that would then send me to the beach but there's like shells you can get in, right. in different things and then if you're already at the diving site and i go next yeah. to you i get a treasure oh, right. you get a treasure we all get we a all treasure get, thank you oprah get a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> really good game family good. weight plus like i said yeah definitely check it out lots of ways of scoring Super i thought fun it was game. really really yeah wonderful fantastic and i won so well whatever that helps <laughs> we will be at gen con come see yes. us we'll be at the booth dice tower booth uh here and there yeah. otherwise walking around a lot come see us come get a button we have little button yeah, pin things you can come get one buttons. you can have it for free we're trying to give them away $3 people don't want them cents. that's not true we haven't tried to give them away yet but people might not want them <laughs> But come get one, make us one. feel better. Yeah, please. All right, guys, we'll see you at Gen Con. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Check us out. Bye. Take sure. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Ellen said bye already. Okay, bye. I like one of these choose your own adventure books, and I also like Escape Room type game. Now I found out about the Crusoe Crew game where I can combine both. Coming up. from Eagle University. Hope you're well. The Crusoe Crew is a cooperative choose your own adventure game where you do this with comic books instead of novel. And not only you choose your own path, but the game also has some puzzle solving elements to it. You play one of four cute characters in this game. Therefore, four different comic books in the game that you can choose to read from. Each player choose their own character and each comic book has slightly different stories and clues, depending on the character's power. There are Sarah, who can talk to the animals, Kik, who has incredible strength, and Neta, who has great agility, and Gabby, who is good at riddles. It plays one to four players. The object is to explore and mainly collecting treasures scattered through the islands. Points get awarded at the end of the game, depending on a few things really. How many treasures you collected, how many players play the game, the age of the players, and so on. I can see families can have fun and play this game together. The game can also be upgraded with these treasure components too, which I think looks pretty cool. Overall, I think this is an easy to go game. Recommended age is 7 plus, so it is great for families. Artwork is really great throughout the comic books and you can read or play this multiple times too. I can see there are a few options you can choose from in the book, similar to choose your own adventure style of book. Well, thanks for watching. We are Middle University on YouTube. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have Buck Rogers Game, Adventures in the 25th Century, published in 1979 by Milton Bradley. This is a two to four player game in which you're trying to board the draconian ship first before your opponents. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board would look like set up. Every player is going to pick a different color thunder fighter and start it at the start space that matches that color. During every one of your turns, you're going to spin the spinner which dictates the direction that you can move a spaceship. You're gonna move the spaceship, one spaceship, either two spaces, or one spaceship, one space, and another spaceship, another space. You decide. If at any time you come to the outside edge here, it's going to direct you to go to a number, and you just go to that number. When another player lands on the same space as you, they are going to be able to use the control panel. What you're going to do is you're going to spin this either clockwise or counterclockwise until you hit a dot, and then you're going to be able to open up that window and do whatever it says. So for example, it says opponent moves you three spaces, or you can send an opponent home, or you're disabled, you go home. You just follow whatever it says. If at any time you're any on any of these numbers, 
a player cannot land on you to use the control panel. These are kind of like safe spots. When you successfully come to the Draconian flagship and put both of your fighters on your color, you have successfully won the game. Buck Rogers in the 25th century's pilot was a theatrical release. It was followed by two seasons on TV. It was developed by Glenn Larson, who also created Battlestar Galactica. And I'm not gonna lie, that little robot, Tweaky, with his looks and his voice, bd 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 that's right, Buck, terrified eight-year-old me. Well, if you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet at me at Retro Board Gamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. Coming from the Dice Tower this week, well, a full slate of reviews. Um, taking a look at the Undo series, uh, Llama, which was one of the games nominated for the Spiel des Jahres, uh, Horrified, a couple abstract games, Shobu and Pastali, uh, the Macho Koro Legacy. So a lot of those are coming out. Uh, also, on Tuesday, we're going to be putting up, or tomorrow if you're watching this, our podcast where me, Eric, Mandy, and Suzanne all take a look at the games that are coming out at Gen Con and talking about what we're looking forward to at that convention. And also, there's going to be a little bit of other coverage for Gen Con. Uh, I'm doing a top 10 small games coming out of Gen Con. Sam is going to be in the studio all week. He's not able to make it to Gen Con, so he'll be doing Gen Camp videos, live stuff here from the studio. And, of course, we have all the different podcasts on the Dice Tower Network. I'd like to point out one in particular, Board Game Design Lab. You can check out one of their podcasts where uh, they interviewed Jim Brieger, a freelancer in the game industry, and what it's like to be a freelancer. Lots of other great shows in the Dice Tower Network, and you can find all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. I'm Jonathan. Steve. Amy. Mark. And this is our speed quiz, where contestants are attempting to guess as many games as they can within a certain category. And this week's category is Dexterity Games. Now, you can have anything from the top 1,000 on Board Game Geek. There's actually only 23 Dexterity Games that fit into the top 1,000. Uh, again, as always, it's two points if it's a game I haven't played, or one point if it's a game I have played. And we're going to start with Amy. Off you go. Catch the Moon. Uh, no. Crokinole. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Clask. Yes. Go on. Um, Rhino Hero. Uh, yes. Flick him up. Yes. Does the Rhino Hero 2v2 two, like, two one count? Super Battle. That one. I'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> uh, Beasts of Balance. Uh, no. Catacombs. Yes. Jenga? No. I'll open it to the Flick floor. Flick Dead of Winter? No. Rampage. Or oh, Terror Meeple City. It's, it's, it's no. They changed the name. Yeah, yeah. Neither. Oh, sorry, yes. Terror Meeple City is on the list. Yeah. Um... Book It King 3D. No. <laughs> uh, there's a few more popular ones here. Uh, oh, a little dear. bit of time left. Uh, oh, I'm blanking out. Uh, just a bind? No. Uh, Subutio. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, Abalon. Is it no. Obviously, everything is still out. Oh, the dimension. Time. Uh, no. <laughs> Dexterity. Making <laughs> 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 games. Oh, I uh, no, no, high school. High school. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Right, let me toss up the oh, scores sorry. and see how they did. Okay, I've added the scores. Steve got four, Amy got two, and Mark also got four, so it's a tie this Ooh. week. Other things you could have had were Bowsack, Dungeon Fighter, Fireball Island, Fuse, wow. Ghost Blitz, Ice Cool, which they got just after the time finished, Junk Art, Meeple Circus, Pitch Car. So there were a few that they could have got there. Did you get any that they missed? Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug the Third. You're watching a Fellowship of Meeples with Doug, Doug and Doug Gaming. Well, recently I saw a movie trailer about a movie called Harriet. It's about Harriet Tubman, the former slave who risked her life to lead others to freedom through the Underground Railroad. If you are unfamiliar with American history, we would highly encourage you to go ahead and research Harriet Tubman because her story is very inspirational. 
And of course, that reminds me of a game called Freedom, the Underground Railroad, which is designed by Brian Mayer and published by Academy Games. The entire subject of the game's uh, topic matter is very sensitive, but they did an amazing job at creating this game. And it's not only fun to play and strategic, but it is super educational as well. Each player will take on the role of leaders from the Underground Railroad and attempt to move slaves from plantations in the southern U.S. to freedom in Canada, all while avoiding the slave catchers whose movements correspond to the role of these dice. Players will purchase tokens to raise funds and move slaves across the country. They may also purchase abolitionist cards to help in the effort. Watch out for the opposition abolitionist. Each round, more slaves are added to the plantations from the slave market. If there is no more room on the plantations, or if you go through eight rounds of slave market cards, you lose the game. To win the game, you must move a predetermined number of slaves to freedom based on how many players there are and your choice of difficulty. While it is a very enjoyable game, it also evokes a lot of thought about a very difficult time in American history. If you would like to know more about the game Freedom, the Underground Railroad, then uh, check out our YouTube channel, Doug and Doug Gaming, for a full playthrough of the game. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching A Fellowship of Meeples with Doug and Doug Gaming. everybody. I am here to share with you a second installment of the Good Sports Spotlight. Monique from the UK emailed me the other week and she was telling me about her boyfriend who is a gamer, but he's really into League and Apex online gaming. But he's the one that introduced her to board games. He got her a ticket to ride Europe and it hooked her. And now she's always wanting to play board games and he is always playing with her, even though he'd probably rather be on the computer. So thank you, Monique, for sharing your story. Um, and thank you, Jake, for being an awesome boyfriend and playing games with, uh, with Monique. So I really think this is a sweet story, and I think that the more um, we thank people for playing games with us, uh, the more they'll be willing to continue. <laughs> That's the idea anyway. So I think it's really important to just remember that board gaming is about people and bonding with people. And um, so not to push them to con constantly be trying new things, but just um, reminding them like, you really just wanna spend time with them. <laughs> So anyway, if you have someone in your life that's always playing games with you and you really appreciate that, go ahead and send me an email and I will put it in a future segment. My email is almostaboardgamer at gmail.com. Thanks for watching the Board Game Breakfast and I hope you guys have a great day. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron from the Borgian Brothers, and welcome to another episode of Mystery Component Monday. So in this segment, uh, I show you a picture of a game piece, and it's up to you to try to guess what game that piece comes from. So put on your thinking caps, because here's this week's picture. Okay, time's up. Pencils down and thinking caps off. Now, the answer to this week's question is Ice Cool. Ice Cool is a dexterity flicking game where each player controls a penguin in a school made of ice. The penguins just can't wait for lunch, however, so they cut class and try to sneakily eat some fish. But they have to be quick about it because guarding the fish is the hall monitor, and he's trying to send all the hungry penguins back to class. A round is over when either one penguin has collected all their fish, or if the hall monitor catches all the other penguins. Players secretly get cards, which are valued 1 through 3, for every fish they grab, or for every penguin they catch. Each round, a new hall monitor is selected, and once every player has had the chance to be the catcher, the game ends and the player with the most points wins. Ice Cool is definitely a game worth checking out if you want to have an exciting and fun time trying to spin your way to victory. And with enough practice, you can even jump over walls. 
And that's this week's game. Congratulations to everybody who got it right. And for everybody else, don't worry about it. There's always next week. But until then, I hope you all have a happy breakfast. All right, what's getting added to the library this week? Well, North American Railways wasn't a huge fan of it personally, but I think some people will like it. Who's it? I like that party games in my library. Terror Below. If you want to fight some worms, it's a lot of fun. Dust in the Wings. Such a pretty game. Glad to have this one. Then we have Gem Hens. This is the new game from Social Sloth. Uh, Roll for Adventure. Really like this cooperative game. I think I'll be reviewing this next week, actually. Escape Plan with the deluxe bits inside. I know people are going to like that. Then, Smash Up. So... Now, Smash Up, I just want to show you kind of what's inside the box at this point in time. Because Smash Up now has every expansion in it. I think all the expansions for Smash Up. And there's still plenty of room inside this box here. So that's kind of cool. I mean, Smash Up, you'll, we'll be able to add expansions probably at least, I don't know, 10 more maybe to fit in the box. I don't know who's going to play it at that point. Here's some of the new rule books and then the big giant one that includes everything for all the games. So there's that. It's weird to me that these boxes aren't square. And then we're adding in Dragon Scales, the new Dice Tower Essential game. Very excited about this one. And Tribes Dawn of Humanity from Cosmos. Yes! I love adding this stuff to the library. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of If You Like This, You Might Like That. Today we are talking about Fantasy Flight games. And going through my collection, I realized I have a fair number of their games. I also realized that a lot of my recent purchases from them revolved around either Star Wars or the Cthulhu Mythos. So today, I thought I'd highlight some of their slightly lesser known games from their lineup. The first game was originally published in 1989, but published by Fantasy Flight in 2010. It is called A La Carte. It's for two to four players and plays in about 30 minutes. You take on the role of a semi-psychotic chef who is trying to perfect their cooking skills. Each player receives a miniature pan and a hot plate, and during the game the players will have a few options to do with their three actions on their turn. The players will all start with a the recipe they wish to cook, which will list a list of condiments the dish must possess, and the temperature the dish should be cooked, along with a heat level that will actually burn the dish. On a player's turn, they will either turn up the heat on their stove by rolling a die, and the die will either allow the player to turn up their, their heat level by one, two, or three levels, or it can offer the player a coffee break where they can randomly select a special action tile, or finally the die can show that all players have to raise their heat by one step. The second action the player can do is season their dish. It can be taking one of the little condiment bottles, which contain wooden cubes, and turning it over above their dish to try and get some of the condiments out. No shaking, no tapping allowed. You can have up to two of each condiment, as a third would overspice the dish. The last action the player can choose is to use one of the coffee break tokens. If the dish is finished, it will score at the end of the game and the players get a new recipe. If the dish is burned or overspiced, it is discarded and the player will receive no points but will receive a new recipe. At the end of the game, the players will add up their points from their dishes and the person with the most points is the winner. That's a la carte. The second game I want to talk about is a great little family game. It is called Hey, That's My Fish. Published by Fantasy Flight in 2011, it's for 2-4 to four players and plays in about 20 minutes. The game is all about the collection of fish on an ever-shrinking ice flow. The game is set up with a random layout of ice flow tiles with one, two, or three fish on them. All players start on a one fish ice flow, and on a player's turn they will move one of their penguins in a straight line from the tile as far as they want. No turns, no jumping empty spots, and no moving through other penguins. When they have finished moving, they will take the ice flow tile that the penguin started upon. On a player's turn, they must move and collect a tile. If they cannot move any other penguins, they are out of the game. When no one can move, the game is over. Sounds all nice and simple, but this can turn into being a little vicious. You can purposely try to isolate other players' penguins. Now, when I first started playing this game with my family, my son was not into Take That Games. But when he started to play Hey That's My Fish, his whole goal changed into making sure mummies and daddy's penguins were cut off. And because you start with a few penguins based on player count, Having one penguin trapped is not the end of the world for a player. Now there is player elimination in this game, but with the speed of the game once one person is eliminated, the game is pretty close to being over anyway. So that's Hey, That's My Fish. The last game I want to talk about is Android. No, nope, not Android Netrunner, but Android. It was published in 2008, plays 3-5 to five players in about 2-4 to four hours. The game is about a dystopian future and there's a murder there. 
Each detective plays differently, and each player must balance the pursuit of the murderer against the personal lives of their detectives and their inner demons. Each detective has a personal plot that are resolved gradually during the game. While dealing with their detective's personal demons, they must also have the detectives travel around the city of New, uh, New Angeles and the moon colony of Heinlein, chasing down leads, calling in favors, and uncovering the sinister conspiracy beneath it all. So, you need to be solving the murder, uncovering the conspiracy behind the murder, and finding inner peace for your detective. The game lasts two in weeks spread out over 12 rounds, and at the end of it, if the players have invested enough time in the plot, they'll be awarded victory points. Otherwise, they will suffer penalties. This game is definitely something different from the other ones I have mentioned in this segment, as it is much more of a complex game. But there is definitely some depth to this. If you're looking for a story-rich game that you can invest some time into, give Android a shot. Now, there are many other Fantasy Flight games out there, so I'd love to hear what your three Fantasy Flight games would be, either in the chat or the comments below. Hey guys, it's Mental Health Minute, and happy Gen Con. I know some of you are attending Gen Con, some of you may have already attended, depending on when this comes out. And some of you are attending other types of cons that are different and more local. I want to talk about people who go to these cons, and sometimes gamers or people in general can have trouble with crowds and a lot of people that they don't know. It can make them uncomfortable. But the draw of the event is so big that they have no choice in their mind but to go. So I want you to be able to be careful when you're at these events and know that some of the people there might be uncomfortable. But they want to play games anyway. So it's about being as friendly as humanly possible, giving a nice smile. If someone is talking to you and you feel like, oh, they're not really into this conversation or they might, you know, be a little uncomfortable, just back down a little bit. It's not personal. It's never personal. People just have trouble with large crowds sometimes, whether they're walking around or they're with new groups of strangers that they don't know and they're trying to get into it, but it's a little more difficult for them. It takes them different amounts of time. And sometimes that can bother people and be like, oh, why is this person not even talking to me? Why are they not listening to me? Uh, they might be. You just might be having trouble recognizing their discomfort. And their discomfort isn't based off you. Their discomfort is based off too much of a suffocating atmosphere in their mind. People are moving back and forth and doing all these things and rushing around because there's a lot going on. And sometimes that might just overwhelm somebody. And for, if you're one of those people, I insist you try anyway. Bring a friend, try something new. It might help you a lot. Have you had an experience like this at a con before? Leave it in the comments below. But my name's Nick. Enjoy your breakfast. Hey everyone, today on To Paint or Not To Paint, I'm gonna take you through Spectral. Hey everyone, Matt here from The Plastic Canvas and welcome to To Paint or Not To Paint, a series where I quickly take you through a game and then talk about whether I think it's worth spending the time to paint the miniatures in it or not. And today we're taking a look at Spectre Ops. This is a 1v all hidden movement game where one player takes on the role of an agent who's trying to sneak into a facility, complete some objectives and then get back out, um, while everyone takes on the role of the hunters who's trying to track the agent down and take them out before they can get out. So, is this game worth painting? For me, this is an absolute no-brainer, yes. First of all, it's an awesome game, lots of fun, really stressful regardless of which side you're playing on, so you're putting in the time to paint a game that is lots and lots of fun. Now also, there's only eight minis in the game, and while they're not the most detailed minis going around, they are far from the worst. And so, you know, even if all you do is a base coat or a base coat and a wash, within 45 minutes to an hour, you can have um, each of these painted up, so within a weekend, you can have them done, ready to go. Now also, the main way that the theme comes out in this game is through the artwork. Um, that board especially, there's some cool lighting effects going on there. A lot of it looks like it's under low light. And with these being just grey plastic, they are removed from that a little bit. And so painting them up really immerses them in the theme um, and helps all of that be brought out. So between this being a game that is lots of fun to play, really stressful on both sides, there's only eight minis, but there's enough in them that you can do some interesting things with them. And the art, the theme mostly coming out in the artwork, definitely worth painting. So if you want to see the full review for this, check out the Dice Tower review. And if you want to see me painting some minis, head over to my channel, The Plastic Canvas. And I'll see you guys next time.
much Gen Con coverage, right? This happens every year where there are people who are just so excited about the newest and biggest convention and they talk about it and it seems ad nauseum that everyone talks about it. And if you're not going, it can be a bit tiring, right? Yeah, I've been there. You know, when I lived in Korea, Korea was a fantastic place and I loved it dearly. Miss it, would love to go back. Um, just a great country, but when I lived in Korea, I went to Origins. That was it. You know, I didn't have a chance to go to Gen Con because usually the school year had started by then. I never went to Essen or any of these other fantastic conventions. And sometimes there was that whole, oh man, it sounds like everyone is having a fantastic time at a convention. And they are, okay? Let's not pretend that going to a convention is not fantastic. Now, not everyone will like every convention. Not every convention is for everybody. Gen Con might be too crowded for some. Board Game Geek Con might be too small for others. You know, everyone has a different kind of convention that they like, and some people like them all. But if you read or follow the Dice Tower or other online media, sometimes it feels like everybody's going to everything and you're the only one not going. Well, you're not. There's tons of people who don't go. On the flip side, sometimes you'll see people like myself and others where we're like, oh, so many conventions. And that's the other extreme, right? You go to conventions all the time, and so sometimes you miss out on that joy of going there and just seeing everything. And so I think there has to be a happy medium. Sometimes people say you cover too much about conventions on the Dice Tower. Well, we feel like we should because the hobby does move and is shaken by these conventions. Games come out and news is released at conventions. That changes the industry. And so for us to be there, to meet our fans who come to them, for us to meet publishers there, for us to report on the news that we find there, they're generally a good thing for us to go to. And reporting on them is kind of what we do. Not to mention, that is what a lot of people like. Look at our top 10 anticipated games at Gen Con last week. A lot of people watched that because it was something that people are interested in. However, in the midst of all that Gen Con coverage, we're still talking about games. And so I get that it can be overwhelming sometimes. It seems like all we do is jump from convention to convention, right? As soon as Gen Con's over, I'll be talking about Dice Tower Retreat. And when Dice Tower Retreat's over, I'll be talking about Essen. And when Essen's over, so on and so forth. And, and in a sense, that is how my life works. I'm always building up to the next convention. But in between those conventions, we're playing games. And the point of conventions is playing games. And playing games is so I can spend quality time with other people. That is why I play games. Now, some people play games. Playing games is fantastic. And I like games. And we talk about games that are good or bad. But it's all about the people. And why I like conventions is because I get to meet people there. But if you can't go to a convention because of time or money, I don't ever want anyone to feel like you are less of a gamer in that sense. You're not. Um, you're not even really missing out. I mean, yet you are missing out on a fun experience, just like you're missing out on Disney World if you don't get to go there, or missing out on seeing the Grand Canyon if you haven't been there, or missing out on a Hawaii trip if you haven't been there. There's lots of things that all of us, we can't do. I've never been to Hawaii. I'm sure it's a fantastic experience. I just haven't been able to make it. And when people come back from Hawaii, they show me all these pictures and it's like, wow, that looks fantastic. But I don't want to ruin other people's joy if they've got to do something I haven't. That's fantastic. But I also don't want to fall into this wall. I can't do all this because we do live in an age where even though you can't get to Gen Con, you can participate. They have live streams that you can watch. You can get the games that Gen Con has pop up booths this year or pop up uh, like conventions all over the place in a sense that you can go to your local stores and get some of the games the same date they're released at Gen Con. And it's getting better and cooler that way. And the coverage is neat and there's no secrets. And these games that are new and brand new at a convention that only the people at the convention can get will be available to everybody else very, very shortly. So cons are fantastic and they're fun. But even if you don't get to go, you still get to participate a little bit vicariously online. And even if that's not interesting to you, we're still talking about all these fantastic games. Cons drive sales of games. It's the truth of it. So they need to exist. They really help out a lot. But at the end of the day, it's the people I play with in my local game group who are the ones I go home to and have a great time with. Hello, my name's Jonathan from Board Game Opinions. Now, I probably have more Fantasy Flight games in my collection than games from any other publisher. I have my games sorted by type, so I have my Euro games in one section, Party games in another section, and at the top, just out of shot there, I have Adventure games. And I think at least 
half of my adventure games are fantasy flight games. If there's one thing they're known for, it is big box adventure games, and they do it really well. I've bought and played their games for years and years and years, from the classic Descent, Journeys in the Dark, the kind of dungeon crawl, Overlord, one versus many, through to the much more modern Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle Earth, with the app integration. They have done adventure games really, really well. They don't just do adventure games. Uh, they're also well known for doing LCGs, the living card games, which is a format I'm a big fan of. Much prefer them to the CCGs. Uh, this is the Lord of the Rings two-player cooperative adventure game. And I've played this for hours and hours and hours. I've got loads and loads of expansions for this and just had a whale of time, particularly playing this one with my son. So if you want games that are gonna draw you in, give you a sense of storytelling, tense decisions, Arkhampara, very tense all the way through. You always feel like you're about to die, and when you squeak out of that win at the end, it's very, very satisfying. So the mechanisms, I think, historically, have not always been great in their games. Uh, particularly this one can be very unwieldy, can really go on. Some of the games go on for a long time, particularly if you're not used to it. But I have to say, in recent years, they've made a big effort to improve their mechanisms, and it really shows. The latest version of Arkham Horror, the mechanisms are much tighter, it's a much better, more streamlined version than the second edition, which is the one I've got. Uh, this latest Journeys in the Middle Earth, uh, Lord of the Rings, the Journeys in Middle Earth, uh, is fantastic in terms of the mechanism, very interesting gameplay, again with the app, lots of interesting decisions to make, but the theme, the storytelling, that's the thing that really comes through again and again. In terms of a publisher, I don't think there's any publisher that does that kind of theme and storytelling better than Fantasy Flight Games. My name's Andy and welcome to Portable Gaming, the show about games which are fun to play in pubs and cafes. So today I want to talk to you about a fantastic little abstract strategy game named Camisado, specifically this pocket edition here. This game is very cool, it's a chess-like game in which you're trying to get your pieces from one side of the board to your opponent's side. And when you do that you either win the game or you'll score a point and you'll reset to start again to try and score three points. However, what makes this game really interesting is the really cool movement mechanics. So say, for example, I start here with a black piece as the purple player. I will pick this up and move it as many spaces forward as I like, or diagonally. So say I move it two spaces forward and land on an orange square. This now means my opponent has to move their orange piece. Now say, in this example play, they decided to do something really stupid and jump straight to the edge to try and fall, pressure me and land on the purple space. That means I now have to move my purple piece, which will let me jump straight along into that final row and win that point or win the game. Now obviously that's a very silly, very stupid manoeuvre, but it shows you the kind of things that you can do because what you want to do is really build your opponent's positions and try to force them into areas where they can only move one of those pieces a few spaces, allowing you to la making them land on the space for the colour you need to move for the killing blow. As the game goes on, if you play the multi-point variant, you get special abilities where you can flip over the uh, pieces once you've reached the end, and they can push pieces out of the way and score more points when you get to the end. Honestly, this is a brilliant little strategy game, and this pocket edition is absolutely fantastic. It comes in this little clamshell pocket, which as you can see, kind of has crenellations which hold all the pieces in, so I can tilt it pretty far, and like shake it about, and the pieces don't move, and that's fantastic when you're on the go. We actually played this at UK Games Expo in a queue for one of the live shows, and we kind of picked it up and just walked around and sat back down and continued playing. It's fantastic. The larger version is gorgeous as well, but this is really cool, and I really enjoy it, and it's such a little brain burner, and I think people would really, if you like the kind of chess-style games, this could be a one for you. So I highly recommend it. This is Camisado Pocket. Anyway, thanks very much, folks. I've been Andy, and it's your round. Hey, I'm Matthew Jude from This Guy's Broken and welcome to Dead Last App. Segment I do. I recently re-bought a game that I had sold a long time ago and uh, I felt weird about it, but it's this game. Technically it's a different version, but it's this game, Concordia. This is Concordia Venus, which is was cheaper and has the whole of the regular Concordia in it, so I got it. It's a massive box and it's slightly nicer looking, but I played this again after I'd completely written it off and said that it wasn't a good game. And I'm so glad that I did. It was really strange. I played it and I thought, what was wrong with me the first time I played Concordia? Why didn't I enjoy it? Because I enjoyed it so much the next time I played it. And this isn't about Concordia. It's just a strange thing where I feel as though when I first played Concordia, it was about four years ago, when I got back into board gaming, and it was just too much too soon. That's what it was. Too much too soon. I wasn't ready for Concordia. Yeah, I wasn't worthy of Concordia. I just feel like it was just too heavy, too involved. But now I've played all of these games and many, many more. 
I played Concordia and I got it and I understood it and it just made my experience of the game so much more and I'm so happy I gave it another chance. So I wondered what other games maybe that you have experienced where you've done this, where you've bought a game, sold it and then gone and played it a long time later and thought, actually, it wasn't the game, it was me, I was wrong. I'm so happy I took the chance on playing Concordia again. Because so many people say it's good, don't they? They can't all be wrong. I mean, they absolutely can't all be wrong. Anyway, I'll see you again next time. <laughs> Bye. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks so much for watching. If you're going to be at Gen Con this week, definitely come by and say hi to us. Um, we'll be at the booth first and last hour. I'll be there every day. And you might catch me at other times during the day. Our artist Tina is going to be there signing stuff. And it just, it's just it's going to be an exciting time. Um, and if you're not going to Gen Con, well, lots of content. This is a normal week content-wise for us. We're going to have all different reviews. I already all recorded it already all posted by the time you watch this so it's going to be fun until next time i'm tom bass and you've been watching board game breakfast on the dice tower see you next week thanks for watching board game breakfast tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with tom vassal and all the gang until next time i'm eric summer and you've been watching board game breakfast a dice tower production sponsored by cool stuff inc an amazing place to buy board games cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.